Hey, what is up everybody? This is Paul. And in this video is what I want to do is give you guys a little bit of intuition as to how to tie together the eigenvalue decomposition or EVD, the singular value decomposition or SVD and the Fourier transform, because actually all of these are pretty closely related. Um, so to do that, I want to use a very simple analogy. And then from there, I'll kind of talk about some other concepts that I think are important and relevant as well. So imagine here I have this river. And so what I want to do with this river is I want to get from point A to point B. Pretty simple. And there's kind of standing in my way from point A to point B, there is a tightrope. Excuse my handwriting. That if I was going to go directly from point A to point B, I could just directly cross this tightrope and it would probably be a lot of work. It'd probably be pretty difficult, but I could do it and it would get me over to point B just the way I want to. Now that's all fine and dandy, and for most people, they would probably just be doing this, just going across the tightrope, not knowing that there's anything else, anything better. But if somebody told you, or if I told you that down the, downstream the river a little bit, there was this point A prime, where if you went downstream a little bit, you'd find a nice little bridge because the river somehow gets narrower there. And at that point, you can just simply walk across the bridge to this point B prime on the other side, and then all you have to do once you're at B prime is sort of retrace your steps backwards that you did to get from A to A prime to get from B prime back to B. So, I mean, obviously if you look at this picture, it's pretty obvious what you do. You go from A, you go down to where you can cross the bridge, you cross the bridge, and then you go back up to the point you wanted to get to on the other side of the river. But this is exactly what we're trying to do when we are doing the eigenvalue decomposition. So imagine here for a second that I have a matrix X in R, N by N. And to take a very simple example, say I want X to the P power. So I'll say A in this case is equal to X and B is equal to X to the P. So hopefully you've all seen this example before. Um, the obvious easy way to get from point A to point B is simply by taking X times X times X times X all the way to P. So that's kind of the, the tightrope way of, of getting from point A to point B. But those of you who are familiar with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you guys are gonna be aware that there is a much better way to do this. And that is to transform X into V lambda V inverse. So over here at A prime, the thing I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write this is equal to V, sorry, this is equal to lambda because lambda is a diagonal, a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues on the diagonal. And the simple way of, I guess, crossing the bridge in this case is going from lambda to lambda to the P, which in this case is just simply, because it's a diagonal matrix, taking each of the elements to the P power. So rather than the fact that each of these, when you're doing X times X times X, each of these is O of N squared operations, this act of going from lambda to lambda to the P is actually just O of N, because you're just taking each of the N values along the diagonal and raising them to the P power, pretty simple. Then once we have lambda to the P, we simply transform this back by doing V lambda to the P, V inverse, which will bring us back to the point B that we wanted to have. So that's a very simple way to kind of think about eigenvalues and eigenvectors is you're, you're and a lot of times you're diagonalizing the matrix, which turns your problem into a much easier problem. You solve the problem in that space, and then you turn your problem back into the original space once you've solved it in this easier space. And there's a whole set of academic papers and literature around these sort of transforms or handcrafted transforms, sometimes they're data-driven, where you try to find this problem space that makes it easier to create your problem, or to solve your problem, sorry. So another good analogy of this is if I get rid of all this, um, these sorts of things, there's another way to think about this as well. Um, or I guess perhaps another example. So just imagine I don't have these X's, um, I don't have X, but perhaps I have a signal on my A side, which is equal to X of N, and we're gonna do discrete time. And what I wanna get on the other side is X of N convolved with H of N. And of course, we all know that the, we, can, we can walk the tightrope by simply doing the convolution, by doing the sum and you know the flip and shift thing. But of course, we all know that there's a much easier way to do this also. 
And that is going from A to A prime, which is of course taking the, in this case, the DTFT of it. So we're gonna get X, big X of E to the J two pi F, which this is just basically saying we're evaluating the Z transform around the unit circle. Then we cross, cross the river because now all we have to do is, um, we're just saying, I guess, Y in this case, Y of E to the J two pi F is equal to X of E to the J two pi F times, do I have enough room here? Sure, times H for E to the J two pi F. So we've turned our convolution problem, which is this sort of really nasty problem into a simple element wise multiplication, very similar to our, um, the case we had before. And then to get it back, we just take the inverse DTFT. So we sort of, I will say this is like I DTFT and going down here is the DTFT. Um, so this is kind of the way we can do convolution with much fewer operations is, and, and the way you actually, the, the benefit that you get here is, is the DTFT and, and these things you can take use of the, the fast Fourier transform if you're actually trying to do this in, in computation land. Um, there are some cases obviously where actually doing this in terms of the convolution sum will be better, but it very quickly gets to a point where it is not better and it is much better to do the DTFT and, and evaluate it that way. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the way we want to think about it. And the fact that these problems are related should probably not be too much of a surprise. And that is because the complex exponential or e to the j2 pi f is the eigenfunction, and I'm sure you've all heard this before, of all LTI systems. Which basically means, well, what does this mean? This basically means that, that our, our, our vector of complex exponentials of different frequencies um, is basically forms this nice little eigenvector that that characterizes, or in some ways, a way to think about it is diagonalizes these linear time invariant systems. So I'm gonna just go ahead and circle this in pink because this is really important. And then I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by this. So when we think of an eigenvector, right? And if I have this matrix X and I have a vector V, um, an eigenvector V is just going to equal by applying X to it, some scaling function or scaling value times our vector v. That's just the definition of an eigenvalue. And when we think of linear time invariant systems, and this also includes um, basically linear differential equations or any, any system that's characterized by linear differential equations, we can have any number of derivatives and integrals in there. And when we wanna think about an eigenfunction, we wanna choose a function where taking derivatives and integrals is really easy. And in fact, it's so easy that all we need to do is think about when we're taking a derivative is multiplying it by this constant value. And when you think about the functions that actually satisfy this property, there really aren't that many. Sure, you got sine and cosine and you got zero. Zero is not very useful. Um, but really, I think what it comes down to is sine and cosine. But even those, if we all know that the sine and cosine can be represented as sort of a specific form of the complex exponential. So the complex exponential is in some ways more basic than sine and cosine. And the exponential is in fact the sort of the function that's derivative and integral are pretty much equal to a scaled version of itself. So if I have e to the lambda x and I take the derivative with respect to x, this is equal to, of course, lambda e to the lambda x. In other words, taking a derivative of any function written in terms of exponentials is just simply equal to a, a scaled version of the exponentials that we have. And likewise, as we've seen, the integral of e to the lambda x, um, this is equal to one over lambda e to the lambda x. So once again, we're using, we're, when we take an integral, all we're doing is we are scaling the original function that we take the integral of, um, but we're scaling it kind of by the opposite. Now, when we think about what's going on with the unit circle, um, the actual scaling factor is, is gonna be this sort of this J two pi F term, which, which involves doing these phase shifts. And that should come as no surprise because you take, you know, derivatives and integrals are just kind of, in some ways, rotating these signals in certain ways, but I don't wanna get too far into that right now. The point is, is that if we know that a signal that is a complex exponential is if we want to take the derivative or integral, it's just simply this, this coefficient or this simple eigenvalue times that signal. And we don't actually have to go through the process of doing anything complicated to get there. So if we can write our signal 
x of, let's just call it, um, let's just do this, yeah, x of n as some sum of complex exponentials, e to the, let's call this just lambda x. Um, if we can just write it this way as some, some set of coefficients, a of n, or maybe in this case, I guess this would be, sorry. As long as we can decompose our signal into this sum of, of exponentials, um, once, if we want to take the derivative or we want to take the integral of this signal, it's very easy because all we have to do is just for each term, bring that constant down in front. And that's kind of the, the real beauty of doing this. So when we think about what Fourier transforms are doing, we're taking our signal and we're writing it as a sum or we're writing it in terms of the decomposition that, that sort of describes it in terms of a sum of these complex exponentials. And by doing that, it's really easy to manipulate the signal in this space because we know how to take pretty much any number of derivatives or integrals of complex exponentials. And then once we get the new values of the coefficients that are, I guess, the, the, the coefficients in front of each of these complex exponentials, we can basically build our signal back by taking the inverse Fourier transform. Um, so if you think about, we have our signal, which is in terms of x of n. And what this is telling us is from like zero, up to the big N, which is the length of our signal, we have a value for each sample index, which is N. And when we take the Fourier transform, what we have is we have a, this will correspond because the Fourier transform is just a change of basis. Um, this will correspond in the frequency domain to uh, various values at different frequencies. So this is like, I guess this would be big X of E to the J two pi zero x of e to the j two pi one, so on and so forth. So these are these are basically the frequencies at each of these components. Now I'm I'm, I'm waving my hand a little bit because there's there's some bookkeeping factors and things like that. Um, but in other words, these are the coefficients to those exponentials because if you remember, an exponential represents just a single frequency. And by writing it this way, it's really easy to take derivatives and integrals. And then all we need to do is reconstruct our signal by, by, by finding these coefficients back in the original time domain. So I hope that was helpful. And in the next videos, what I wanna do is talk about the difference between inner products and outer products and what the dyadic decomposition is um, in terms of the singular value decomposition, because I think that's really important. So hope you guys found this helpful and I'll see you later.